Welcome to another edition of Inside Medicine. I'm your host, Doug Geinzer, the CEO of Las Vegas Heels. And we are here in the studio today with Dr. Mark Penn, the uh, founding dean of the Roseman College of Medicine. For those of you that are new to Inside Medicine, we broadcast right here in the studio on Thursdays. And then we rebroadcast out on YouTube, uh, Facebook, Roku, all of those funky uh, social media channels so you could see the uh, edition of Inside Medicine afterwards. We like to bring in guests that are doing innovative things to healthcare here in Las Vegas. Folks that are doing things to improve the quality of care to those people in the community. And today we have Roseman University with us and they're going to talk to us a little bit about the new College of Medicine, which is a happening thing. It's a wonderful thing for the community and I uh, want to welcome Dr. Mark Penn to the studio. Well, thank you, Doug. It's great to be here. Thank you for inviting me to Inside Medicine. And this is not your first time in the studio, so this is uh, great to have you back and learn about a little bit about the progress of the Roseman College of Medicine. Yes, and I, I hope that through this time we'll be able to help people to understand more about the exciting things that are happening at Roseman. Yeah. So let's start with Roseman University. Mm -hmm. uh, tell us a little bit about Roseman University, where they came from, where they are, and how the College of Medicine is fitting into the new the, the university. Well, the first things that I would say about uh, Roseman University is it is Nevada born. Uh, it was born in uh, Henderson in 1999. And one of the exciting things for us at, at Roseman University is we'll be having our 20th year anniversary starting this fall through this next year. So That's we're great. really excited. A lot of people don't realize Roseman's been around for 20 years. For 20 years. It's higher education, first mm -hmm. of all, and it's also a private nonprofit uh, higher education institution that focuses only on the health professions. Which is big, big need. It is. And so they started in Henderson with a college of pharmacy. Uh, they then eventually added nursing, and then they added an MBA that was focused on health care. And then they focused on a dental needs by having an orthodontic dental residency. What's really exciting is, is that uh, just in the recent past now, they've decided to bring on a general, ortho, or a general dentistry for Roseman University. That will be near their uh, Henderson campus as well. And then just a few years ago, they made the decision, the Board of Trustees made a decision to bring on an, an MD granting medical school. So we're just really uh, excited about all the different things that are happening, but it's all related to the health professions. And it's all built out of the need for here in Nevada, especially Southern Nevada, but across Nevada for the health professions. And, and so everything that they are putting together has to say, is there that need? Yes, there is a need. So Roseman really wants to be a, a front part of that. And there's a lot of uniqueness to Roseman. I love <laughs> the fact that it's Nevada born. Uh, everybody knows the owners, the founders of this. Watching it start from a pharmacy school to where it is today with the acquisition of the assets up at uh, the, the, in Summerlin. What's the uniqueness behind it in terms of some of the curriculum and how that comes together? Because a lot of people don't realize you teach much different uh, than other schools out there. So talk to us a little bit about that. Well, let me build off of what you said about the founding because that's really critical. The three founders that we have uh, came to this area basically saying, first of all, we want to do education differently. And there were pharmacy background. And so when they came here, they said, we think we have a better way to do it and we want to do it differently. And so that's why they created a private entity that they could uh, basically build this educational programming around. <clears throat> so when they came, they, they fundamentally came and, and began to build a curriculum for pharmacy education that was built around what we call mastery learning. And mastery learning has a lot of different uh, meanings uh, in different people's minds, but just let me give you just a few of those tenets so that people would understand it. First of all, it's basically about the student. It's about student success and helping them to succeed. So when students come into this type of a program, they basically are not entering a traditional type of way of learning. So what does that mean? It means that if you, first of all, when we step back, we, we say what kind of a learning environment, and we don't have a traditional lecture hall. Mm -hmm. Our basic lecture areas are what we call theater in the round. And so the professors are in the center, and then the students are around, uh, say, the outside. And so students are no more than three to four rows away from the professors, increasing contact and communication within the, in the, in say, the lecture hall. The lectures are typically not real long lectures because the second part of this is about active learning. 
So there's an expectation that you might have somebody do a lecture in that theater in the round classroom. Then what happens is the students get a challenge and they say, okay, go off and learn together in your small learning group. And so there's a lot of small group learning, which is really, which is really fun. And they get, in many respects, get to take leadership roles in how they handle things. The other part of this that I, that one of the things, there's two, two main things that have brought me to the Roseman system. I really appreciated their, their reaching for excellence. And so there's a lot of reassessments, assessments, and things like that that go on for students that help them to succeed. So every two weeks or so in the curriculum, students have an assessment. That's called a test. Mm -hmm. What is different about that from many other institutions is that in some institutions, a 70% is passing. Or it could be a 50% if your professor was kind to you because the class didn't do well. And so let's say, let's grade on the curve. Uh -huh. At Roseman, we don't grade on the curve. But our standard is 90%. And I'll say that again. It's 90%. It's huge. And that is huge. And so a lot of people that will hear it sometimes the first time will say, well, I don't want to go there. Or how can students succeed? Well, that's why students can come because they know that they're embraced in the process. They learn how to master information over, over time because you have to master one thing before you go to the next level of different learning and mastering. The feedback is in two-week blocks, basically. You learn, again, how well you are doing or not doing. That particular feedback is so important. I don't see that happening a lot. And not only, not only do you get your test result back, you say, okay, I, I now have a 92, but you know what you missed on that same day. You get that feedback. Your team together, you might have a, a team of maybe six students that are with you. They get their grades as well. And then you get together and you you – run through your test together, basically the scores and everything, and say, let's take it again together. So they take it again together as a tool. Well, wow. And then they get a, a, a result from that that helps sometimes with your scoring together as a team. Now, the point being is, is if you don't make the 90%, by the time you get through this system, then you have to do another reassessment with a different test. But the point being is, is that we want to make sure that students attain at least a 90% mastery learning level. So that's, that's, very important. that's awesome. So that's running through all of the other areas, nursing <laughs> and pharmacy. You're getting ready to build a medical school. So it's going to allow a more multidisciplinary approach. Mm -hmm. uh, as we all know, medical education is expanding here in Las Vegas. Toro's here, UNLV operated. Do we need another medical school? Well, I get asked that periodically. I'm not getting that asked uh, more recently, very frequently. It was asked a lot shortly after... UNLV got accredited, which we are very, very pleased for because the, the area needs another medical school in UNLV as well as Toro. The one thing that I've always done since I've been here and before I came here is I always set the standard that we're going to be collaborative no matter what we do. And so whenever we talk about UNLV or Toro, it's always going to be positive. The point is, is that we're here to really help all of the different needs in healthcare that, that the Colleges of Medicine can do together. So I'm, I meet periodically with our deans, uh, the other deans of the medical schools, and we talk about how can we collaborate because there's a lot of different things that, that are going on that need some, some uh, help in this area. To your specific question about do we need another medical school, the answer, in my opinion, is, is a resounding yes. And the, the reason is because every one, first of all, it's, it's more of a local thing, and then the other is more of a, a regional and statewide thing is that basically each one of our medical schools is going to have different ways of approaching education, research, as well as patient care services. I think that's really neat for our community to have different ways of doing this. And there's great need in all those areas to improve and to enhance what we're doing. So UNLV will do it a certain way in all those areas. Toro will do it a certain way. And then Roseman will. We'll do our educational model that I was just talking about. And then the other part of this is that the, the patient care services are really, really in great need here in all kinds of health professions, but in particular with physicians. The bigger picture of this is, is that for health care for the physician workforce, a recent study by John Packham at UNR from, uh, uh, from the UNR School of Medicine, and he does this every year and does a phenomenal job with the data points. But it, you look at it and you say, well, where are we at as a state? And I've seen different data, but the most recent data is about 2,600 uh, physicians are needed just to be average if we want to be average compared across the, the country. 
those numbers are around 21, 2200 down here in, in Clark County alone. And so there is a great need, first of all, for the end point. The other point about uh, medical schools, because we can really influence and affect maybe recruitment of physicians to our community, but we can also turn them out from a perspective of training them. The other thing that I've been working on with the other deans as well as hospitals and the CEOs and so forth in our community, including you, Doug, in the past, as well as the governor's office, is working on the graduate medical education component of this because that's really critical. We can train a lot of medical students, but we need to have the graduate medical education or residency spots. What's exciting right now is, is that this week is match day. for Today's match day. Today is match day. <laughs> And I wanted to talk a little bit about that in a moment, but I'll, I'll, I'll just let me finish the point on this is that the, we are so far behind in our physician workforce, number one, not only in the physician workforce, but also in research. Mm -hmm. We also need, in my opinion, to have more ways of teaching, different kind of teaching. And I think Rosamond has a really unique, exciting way that people, they'll draw certain kinds of, of students as well as faculty to us. And because of that great, uh, say, gap that we have and what, what we need, <clears throat> all the medical schools are needed to bring that, that workforce to the, to the fray here. And so we basically are working together to make it happen, and I'm, I'm excited about us being a part of that. And for the record, I absolutely agree we need more medical schools. <laughs> yeah. I just, I, I full <clears throat> supporter of Roseman and everything that you're doing. You're approaching it a little bit different, building a community-based medical school. What does that mean? Well, Doug, let me just mention one other quick thing about um, do we need another medical school. <clears throat> I was recently talking with Trip Umbaugh, who is the uh, consulting firm that worked with uh, UNLV and the Lindsay Institute when uh, UNLV was coming online uh, early on. And I was just talking with them about that specific question. And they're of the same mindset is that we need another medical school here. And basically, um, you know, one of the things is, is uh, what does that look like? And Roseman is really poised to bring this on and be another very key player in the medical realm here. So I just wanted to let you know that it's not just a local phenomenon kind of a thing. It's also uh, others outside of us externally are also saying the same thing. Community-based medical school, that's what's really exciting to me. I come from a system in Ohio where what we had to do is we had to prove ourselves every day with our community. And so we had eight uh, hospitals, basically, that we worked with that basically we didn't own, they didn't own us. So the community-based part of this, when you say community-based, it's that versus a traditional model. A traditional model typically means a medical school and a hospital system are tightly bound together. They could own one another. There could be other relationships with it. In this case, what I believe is I'm looking at the landscape here, and, I, and I, when I first came in 2012, just to kind of explore things with Roseman, um, you know, I was looking at the landscape. People were telling me, don't come here because we didn't have the, the proper landscape to build a medical school here. And I felt that basically that's the challenge I like to take on. We can do this. We can really come on with a different attitude, mindset, but we have to change the culture of medicine here. So part of this is, is getting hospitals in our area that are not familiar with medical education as much to become more in the medical educator realm. And so part of that is the graduate medical education. What's really been exciting over the past few uh, years here, working with the other medical schools as well as the, uh, the governor's office with graduate medical education, there are hospitals that are stepping into that situation of saying, we want to basically raise the level of what we're doing by having residents in training or the graduate medical education programs, which takes it up a whole nother notch as far as education as well as patient care services. And so the community-based model, as I step back on that, is, is again, we don't own them, they don't own us, but we work together, we collaborate together, we, we work together across the region. So let me give you a real uh, quick example. We have uh, say, um, affiliation agreements with pretty much most every hospital system here in, in Nevada because we're going to be able to play with everybody in a sense. We're going to be able to work with them, educate together, do research and all those things. I'm going to point out one particular health system, and that's the Valley Health System. Basically, they have stepped together with us to say, we want you to really help us with the academic side of things. And so they've asked us to be their primary academic partner. So in that, what I have done, <clears throat> and kind of using a model that I came from that works across the country, basically, in community-based model, 
you share resources with those systems to reduce costs for costs for yourself as for as well as for that system. So my department chair of family medicine, Dr. Tom Hunt, is also the program director of the family medicine program for the Valley Health System, who is just going through the match uh, process this week. And so what's really neat about that is, is that I'm able to hire people. I'm able to also share his, him with them. And we can also have appointments, faculty appointments, which a lot of these particular faculty coming on to come into these resi programs want to have. So it's a sharing process is kind of what the neat thing about all of this is in the community-based system. It's an exciting time. It is. To be in medicine in Las <clears throat> Vegas, to watch academic medicine come into the market because we frankly haven't had it mm -hmm. before and to watch that and all of the systems come together to partner and, and collaborate with all of the medical schools is utterly amazing so how's the medical school going well I get to ask that because um, just as we go back to what uh, transpired we came online back in 2014 or so and then we went through the accreditation process just like UNLV did and UNLV was successful and uh, there's good reasons for that. And then we were not successful in getting our accreditation back in 2016. Um, UNLV was very successful for, I believe, three primary reasons. One is that, that they had the funding support from the state. Uh, the second is, is that they had um, uh, practices that uh, were with UNR, School of Medicine, and one day they were UNRs, and then the next day they became UNLVs, which I've never seen. <laughs> I mean, it's just wonderful for them, obviously. Um, and then the third thing, uh, basically, is they, they had some graduate medical education programs that were also with the UNR School of Medicine that, that came over. And so Barbara Atkinson and I talk about that and, and how grateful she is to have that uh, support from the state and the things that I just mentioned. So our path is different. And so when I, people ask me how's it going, I just say our path is different. It requires patience. It requires persistence because we're private. We're a private medical school in a private entity, basically. And so when we talk about it, it's a different path. Uh, when I went back to the Board of Trustees at Rosemuters, we talked about this. You know, it was disappointing not to get it, but we, we did so well with our last visit. They had, out of 93 elements that they had listed for the standards that we had to comply with, we only missed one. Oh. And that one was not sufficient financial resources. And the issue was we had some, but we didn't have enough. So we had pretty much everything else ready to go, Doug, and that was kind of the exciting thing for us. So what we did when we went back to the Board of Trustees, I basically gave them a plan. And it was basically a two-fold plan and then adding a third component to it. One of them was primarily to keep engaging our community. We're not going to – we're, we're going to continue to keep our heads up, be patient, persistent, do community service, engagement activities, develop pipelines, which we've done a remarkable job of doing. So we work with our high schools and others in, in the community, middle schools, and we're making a difference in just kind of creating that pipeline. The other, the other things just really happen to do with two other things. One is, is that we need to build our clinical practice of medicine, which we're going to talk about. We're going about. to jump into that next. We're going to yep. jump into that. But that helps with the revenue sources for a private, just like it does for a public uh, medical school. And then the third component of that is philanthropy. So we've doubled our efforts with philanthropy and we're making some inroads in our philanthropy. So when people ask me, well, then what's the timeline? I just say, when we get sufficient resources. I'm right now, and this is all a big guess right now, Doug, but we're probably somewhere around one to two years away from getting adequate, sufficient resources so that we can go through the accreditation process again. So you recently opened up the <clears throat> Roseman Medical Group down at the Spring Valley Hospital. We want to jump into that and talk a little bit about it, but that adds to the success of getting a medical school off the ground. How do those two come together? Well, when you look at the data across the country, and, and it's both private and public, there are different, say, revenue streams that come into a medical school. We all want to believe that we're basically wanting to do this because we want to serve our communities, and that's truly what we're here for. But you also have to have revenues in order to exist. It's just like a practice. You can't practice if you don't have revenues to pay your staff and things like that. So when you look at the different um, places that money comes from, with UNLV, a large part came from the state. Other parts of it are from philanthropy. Other parts are from the clinical practice of medicine. 
Other parts for us are going to be coming from the university, you know, contributions from the university, and then there's others. And some of that is through the research and research grants. The clinical practice of medicine is so important, has become more and more important over the past 10 to 15 years. State support dollars across the country in different states has gone down. Where I came from in Ohio, it kept going down year by year. And you have to find other ways to generate revenue. And so one of the, the revenue streams that has com- continued to become more and more important is the clinical practice revenues. So here's the example, just percentage-wise. In a public entity, it's about 30 to 35% of their revenues typically come from um, the clinical practice. In a private uh, enterprise like we are, it's 40 to 45%. So that's why it's so important that we get started and got started with our clinical practice of medicine. We're just so excited for the Roseman Medical Group. So it's critical. And we were fortunate enough to um, help bring together a group to do the ribbon cutting yes. of the, the, the practice last week and maybe two weeks ago now. And that was an amazing day. You had so much support, congressional, local elected officials that came out to really support the practice. So what does that feel like to, to hit that milestone? Well, because we're, we are community-based, when you look at the values that we'll look at soon, one of the words in there is community, and I use that word out there all the time. This is about connecting with our community, and we have done that from the very first day that I've stepped on campus here. And we continue to stay connected. And when, you know, I was looking at the, uh, the picture of the ribbon cutting and so forth, like you said, I was really pleased that we had four of our board of trustees members there. Our president was there, President Renee Kaufman. And then we had the Congress uh, men and women that also represented, even Mayor Goodman had sent a, a nice congratulatory note. And so we were very pleased with the politicians that had uh, some nice comments for us. How did it feel? Wonderful. <laughs> and, I, you know, it was really an encouragement. One, one thing I talk about lately is, is that because um, it, it's a long haul for doing what we're doing in a private entity. And, you know, you just have to be uh, patient at this. You need encouragers and you need champions. And that's what I'm looking for in the community. And we're finding a lot of people that are really encouraging us and champions for us out in the community. So the foundation of the Roseman Medical Group is your values. And you've got an amazing value statement. Talk to us a little bit about that. Well, when we looked at this, um, as far as what do we want to continue to bring to the fore for the community, because we really want to make it meaningful and not just be words and not just be something that is just casually mentioned. Doug, we use this, these values everywhere I go and everywhere I go, it's very positively received. It's built around, as you can see, if you look at the values and you'll look right down the middle in red, you can see patients that go down through the middle of that. So the primary issue for our values is that our values are built around the patients that we serve. And that's critical. Uh, When I'm a family physician, and so I love to take care of families and patients, whoever they are, from whatever walk of life they are but they have to have respect. And so when you look at all of the different things there, I'm not gonna go through all of them, but you can see the different words there, but the top one is competence. The word competence kind of mirrors the, um, the high levels of accomplishment that we need to have our students master material in the Roseman system. But it's also about the high level that we need for the profession of medicine as well as the other health professions, because you want the best. You want people to make the best decisions for you. The other part of this, as I said, is community on there, but there's others. Uh, the, the main one that I would say that kind of is a big one for this community is diversity. We are really reaching out to all different people groups throughout our community, and we're really encouraged. We belong to different chambers and uh, really getting a lot of encouragement through those. We're part of the Lambda Chamber, the Asian Chamber, the Latin Chamber as examples, and there are others, and we're just so grateful. But the other thing I just wanted to come back to at the very beginning, just to kind of cement this, is that I want to thank you and Heels for what you had done to help us with uh, showcasing what we were doing. We're just so excited about this. This is our first one. It's our very first one of many to come. And then also Las Vegas Metro and uh, Sally Dobler for coming with a ribbon cutting. It was a great event. And I just love the fact that you put the patient at the center of everything. So here we are. You're in motion. You're getting things done. Your medical group is open. What's next? 
Well, it's about the future, right? And it's about saying, what is the plan from the very beginning? The plan from the very beginning was to do what we're talking about. Had we gotten accredited, we'd be further down the road. So part of this is we have to keep working toward accreditation and keep working and getting more philanthropists to help join us. That's one part of this. But the other is we're right now looking, Doug, at some expansion of our clinical practice. The one at Spring Valley, we just about, we're just about uh, uh, having to the maximum limit of, of providers that we can have in that. We, we're looking at hiring another person coming in July. So what's neat about that practice, we have two neurologists. You know, one that really is very, very good in one area, another is good in another. One's Alzheimer's, for example, Parkinson's disease, uh, things like that. And uh, we're just so excited about the different kind of things that they bring to the table. We also now have uh, three family physicians. We have a pediatric nephrologist. And the other person joining us in July will be a family physician. We're going to continue to recruit. But right now we're looking for other places across the, the Southern Nevada region to say, where do we want to locate to meet need, to meet the community's need for health care? So what are those needs? We know that there's a, a big demand for primary care services, specialty services. What are the other service lines that are in demand in the marketplace right now? Well, there's just a lot. When I, when I look at all of the different specialties of medicine, and you look again, I go back to John Packham's work with UNR. Um, that's an external source that basically looks at all the needs. And it, he even looks at nursing and, and pharmacy and what have you across the state. There's a great need in, in, uh, in nursing. And, you know, that's one of the other things that I mentioned earlier that Roseman does and does well. But in medicine, you know, physicians in general, there's a great need. But in all of the specialties, pretty much all of the specialties, there's a great need. So as we go forward and we say, which, which ones do we want to focus on? There's two ways that we've been looking at this, Doug, for us. One is opportunistic, and the other is strategic. And I use those two words because one is we've had a strategy about where we want to go. But the opportunity shows up at our door because we have a physician that says, I really like where you're going. I really would like to join. I like your values. We hear that a lot. We really want to know if we can come aboard. And so we're listening to our physicians that are in local, it's opportunities and so forth. But strategically, we also know that we need to grow into other subspecialties in medicine eventually. Geriatrics will be a big area for us. Uh, pediatrics will be a big area. And of course, and surgery will be added to all of that as well. So strategically, we're going to be growing in different ways, just depending on what's available first, but also what we may need to recruit either here or outside of our state. Perfect. So we talked about the medical group, where that is. Mm -hmm. Your philanthropic <clears throat> efforts, where are they? Where are they heading? Tell us a little bit about your philanthropic efforts. Well, one of the things that I had mentioned uh, that I would do from the very beginning is, is that we wanted to build relationships for philanthropy. And I didn't want to just be going out and just asking people just to give. Uh, the issue is, is my purpose is, is I need to make sure that if you're going to give to us, Doug, that you have a relationship. You know, you know what you're giving to, and you can trust us. So I have been doing meetings a, a lot, individual meetings with a lot of potential donors over the years. <clears throat> I have a director of philanthropy, Stephen Peralta, that also works with me, and we go out and we do a lot of the conversations with people. We even bring them over to our campus so they can see the vision because we can talk through our vision. So where we are right now, we created way back, it would have been in 2017 in uh, uh, August, September, we had a ceremony th that the Engelstadt Family Foundation had given us $10 million to begin our Breakthrough in Medicine campaign. Basically, our campaign is twofold. The big overarching campaign is $150 million, 150. And the reason for that is, is all medical schools take somewhere between 150 to $250 million to get off the ground, and that's for your operations. Um, the other part of this is to get off the ground for just for the accreditation process, we need around 60 to 70 million. So that's what our target is right now. If we get that initial 60 to 70 million, <clears throat> we're able then to keep moving forward. So where we are specifically on that, we have somewhere around 14 and a half million dollars raised thus far. And then we have some other ask out there that we're just waiting on people to see whether or not that will happen. It's been a challenge. Um, uh, you know, UNLV went through some difficulties with some of their 
uh, their donors in the past. And some of those, um, those kind of situations where we've talked to people in the community, the, the people in the community are basically hesitant. You know, they're kind of just watching, waiting, and seeing. So I always look at it this way. We're going to meet people where they are. We're going to show our value to them. We're going to show that we can really do something really critical for our community. Uh, we're looking at a lot of different ideas on how to expand, and that's going to tie into the donor base as we move forward. Well, as you know, we're a big supporter of Roseman University and everything that you do. We look forward to you opening up the new medical school and everything we could do to support it. You have that. Mm -hmm. uh, we've got to bring this episode to an end. We have so much more we can talk about. My suggestion is let's get you back on the show in a couple months. Sounds great. Uh, because I think you're going to have a lot more to uh, announce, a lot more happening. Yes. Uh, it's been wonderful having you on the show. Great to get caught up. Our visitors and, uh, and listeners were, will know how to get in touch with you so they could give, give, give. That's an important thing. Yes. But we're going to have to bring the show to a close. I want to thank everybody for joining us on Inside Medicine today. Uh, join us next week as we bring together uh, other leaders of the healthcare community to talk about how we advance healthcare right here in Las Vegas. Thanks, and you guys have a great weekend.